going to quickly uh, start um, and introduce everybody. So hello, everyone uh, from the panelists. Uh, hello, everybody attending. Today we're having uh, a uh, special Origin Trail event, which will be uh, focused on uh, technologies uh, of, uh, that are harnessing network effects and the Web3. And um, with us today, we have as special guest, uh, one of our uh, new advisors, the inventor of internet, uh, the visionary professor, Bob Metcalf, who I'm sure everybody knows uh, uh, knows about and knows about the famous Metcalf's Law. Uh, he will be speaking about uh, the 40 years of Metcalf's Law with us in the next 20-ish uh, minutes. Um, and then we will continue with a couple of presentations uh, about uh, from the Trace Alliance, as well as uh, one for myself on Origin Trail, uh, finishing with a short panel discussion. Hello, everybody, uh, and welcome, Professor Metcalf. How are you feeling? I'm great. I, you know, if if you're looking for someone to blame on the malfunction of the internet, I, I'm your guy. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it, it, it's it's definitely partly your fault, but uh, I guess it's the the fault that it, it exists in the first place, right? <laughs> yeah, it's Ethernet dropping all those packets out there. <laughs> uh, awesome. Let, let me know when you. you'd like me to start with my remarks. Thank you for, now for, the time. For, I think it's a good time. We have about 80 people in. Uh, feel free to start whenever, Professor. And uh, yeah, I'm here and I'll stop you when I feel like um, a good question might pop up. Okay, well, I've collected some thoughts about connectivity in general and Metcalf's law in particular. But in case the internet goes down again, uh, let me tell you, I'm here to say that what you all are working on is very important and it's also very hard uh, and and you're playing with fire. When I say you're playing with fire, you're playing with connectivity. And I learned that I learned over a long period of time that connectivity is powerful. Uh, it can be surprising and challenging. And so I would like to share with you a few remarks about all that. Is, should I do that, Branimir? Absolutely. Go ahead, Professor. Very excited okay. to hear. Let me give you a quick summary of my journey, my so-called journey. Uh, which began in 1946. Fortunately for me, the next year the transistor was invented, 1947. Uh, I know in um, in fifth grade I built a machine that would add uh, would add any number between one, two, and three to any other number between one, two, and three, and light a light indicating the sum two, three, four, five, or six, and that was the beginning of my uh computer field that device however was not connected to anything it wasn't until i got to mit that i built a uh, uh device I began to build devices that connected things together so I, I got on the arpanet in 1970 at mit by building a, a so-called 1822 device that connected mit to the uh, then internet called the arpanet and then in uh, 72, I did the same thing for Xerox and connected Xerox research into the then ARPANET. And then in 1973, I got lucky. In 73, they gave me a building full plans for a building full of personal computers. The first time in history there had ever been a building full of personal computers, one on every desk. And my luck was I was given the job of building a network to connect them together. And we'll hear a little bit more about that later. Uh, in 1979, I founded a company called 3Com to uh, build out the internet. Uh, and then I left 3Com uh, many years later, 1990. And around 1993, uh, a, uh, a slide I used to sell products to connect things together got to be called Metcalf's Law. And I'll talk a little bit more about Metcalf's Law. And then in 1999, my company, 3Com, for one nanosecond, uh, was valued, inflation adjusted, at $52 billion. Alas, I didn't even get half of that. And then uh, in 2013, I'm almost done now, I took another look at Metcalf's Law and transformed it into the, uh, into the uh, time domain. And now in 2021, here I am 
um, sharing thoughts with you all. I think one, one thing to note is how long things take. One of the things uh, that I've learned is some things take, they just take a long time. And in many cases, you have opportunities to make things happen in a time that was thought impossible by others. But the timing of things and how long things take is a very uh, powerful input to whatever you're doing. Now, the, uh, j just as a warning, and in the 1970s, I became part of a project in the early internet called the Data Reconfiguration Service. And it was an effort to write a, a special purpose programming language to convert data formats. And the goal was so that the different data formats sprinkled around the internet could then be unified into one siloless web of information that everyone could access. This project did not succeed. Uh, it, there's some papers are written and you can look them up, the Data Reconfiguration Service, circa 19, uh, 1970s. And what, what killed that effort was standardization. It proved more effective to just use all the same software instead of trying to go between uh, incompatible things. So in your consideration of Web 3.0, you're going to face that choice over and over again. The choice between creating interoperable conversion things and just uh, making standards and having everyone use the same formats. So in, in the development of the uh, connectivity of the internet, uh, the, uh, there's an important distinction, the development of platforms and the development of applications. And I kind of think my model of innovation is that those two activities uh, unfold. First, you build a platform and then the apps emerge and you build a new platform and the new apps emerge over and over again. Uh, and then there's that very special kind of app the killer app. So you develop a platform and then you start looking for uh, the killer app. That is the app that's going to get it going. Otherwise, it, your uh, platform just sits dead in the water. So take a look at Ethernet, the, uh, this cable that ran down the middle of a corridor and connected machines together. Uh, its killer app was a laser printer. We built a laser printer a page per second, 500 dots per inch, uh, inch, that's about 20 megabits per second. And I was given the job of developing the uh, operating system for this little printer. By the way, this little printer was eight feet long and five feet wide. Uh, so developed the operating system, the networking protocols, and the Ethernet hardware. And uh, we all decided that the only way that you could print on this gorgeous high-speed bitmap printer was over the Ethernet. So guess what? Everybody had to be on the Ethernet. So this printer is what drove people to, to plug in this, this card into their uh, PC so they could be connected to the printer. So the printer was the, was the first killer app. We also ran into our first competitor. Ethernet's first competitor was called SneakerNet. People wearing sneakers could carry a disk down the hall and print from that disk rather than have a network card. The network card costs thousands of dollars. What do we need that for? We just have a disk. We put the document on the disk. We run down the hall. We put the disk into the printer and we print it out. So in a way, Ethernet invented Command P, the idea that instead of putting your document on a disk, you just hit Command P and print it uh, automatically. Uh, the next killer app was Telnet. The entire internet was built for resource sharing and the first uh, protocol we developed was called Telnet, it allowed you to log into remote time sharing systems. And, uh, and, and it was odd, the Telnet, the whole internet made a transition from a, a network to serve dumb terminals to a network to serve personal computers. And Telnet was kind of the bridge. We implemented Telnet on personal computers rather than using uh, dumb terminals to connect. But then came the real killer app of the early internet called email. And you may have heard of that. It's probably still the killer app. So the idea of resource sharing and, and logging into people's computers across the network quickly faded in favor of email, which took over. Now, my own company, 3Com, started, uh, started selling Ethernet. And guess what? Our customers wanted us to give them software to make the Ethernet useful. They didn't 
want to buy our car, our ethernet cards that they plug into their PCs and write all their own software. They wanted us to write the software. So we guessed what they would want to use their networks for, and it was called PFMTS, print, file, mail, terminal service, and uh, stubs, which you should think of as APIs. So we developed a uh, software package that did PFMTS, and we started selling starter kits, three node networks, uh, where you could put a printer on one of the PCs and share it with the other two PCs. So you could take a disk, a 10 or maybe even a 20 megabyte disk and put it on one PC and then share it with the other two PCs. Or you could send an email from one PC to the other PC among the three of them in this starter kit. Well, the product shipped, the product worked, and the customers concluded that it wasn't very useful. Sharing printers was pretty useful because the printers were expensive then. A laser writer sold for $7,000. And the 10 and 20 megabyte disks, no one knew <laughs> what to do all that storage for. I mean, 20 megabytes. What would you possibly do on all that? Anyway, so they started sharing it, and that worked. And the email was completely useless because who wants to send email to two other people? You, you know, email has to reach. So we began to learn. We began to learn that connectivity, the connectivity to other people through email turned out to be the big disappointment in that package. Printer sharing, file sharing, slam dunk, email among three people. And it was out of that that I produced a slide. When I say slide, I mean the 35 millimeter slide, uh, not a, uh, the PowerPoint wasn't until 1987, so quite a bit later. And on this slide, I argued that the reason that this three, these three node networks were not useful is they weren't big enough. And that the remedy of that, of course, was to have our customers buy more of our products and make their networks bigger. And as it turned out, that was uh, not a lie. And uh, that the, connectivity, the connectivity took off. And, uh, and uh, shortly thereafter, our company went um, uh, public. Uh, so that slide, that said the growth, uh, the, the uh, cost of the network goes linear in the number of network connections, the uh, number of cards that you could buy. They were, they were almost $1,000 each. And then, the, but the number of possible connections went up as N squared in that every node could talk to all the, all the others. That's N times N minus one or N, roughly N squared. And that uh, in the 90s became known as Metcalfe's Law. Uh, how am I doing, Branimir? I think you're doing great, Professor. Keep on going, uh, and uh, do do let us know if you uh, if you're going to mention at some point also the criticisms to the law, because uh, I'm sure you will. <laughs> the criticisms of my law? Yeah, I think uh, the way you're speaking, it seems like you're taking the the the, the talk there. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, yeah. Uh, one more. Yeah, it's on this next card that I have right over here. Uh, all right. A slight digression, in the 1990s, I became the CEO and publisher and columnist in a magazine called InfoWorld. And, it, and magazine publishing is very exciting work. And one of its principles is that it's called the separation of church and state. And what they mean by that is that you have uh, editors out finding information to, that's useful to the readers, and that's the church. And the state are the advertising people who, since the editors have attracted the attention of the readers, will sell that attention to people who may want to reach them through uh, advertising. Well, guess what? Advertising is a form of connectivity. Advertising is a very powerful form of connectivity. It connects buyers and sellers together. And, it's, and, and we discovered on the internet that advertising became the killer app of the internet. The internet is now paid for by advertising. Uh, several examples would include Google and Facebook, just to name two. So we learned that information was just not separation of church and state. There was a third kind of content, kind of content that was not generated by the editors and not generated by the, the uh, advertisers, content generated by the readers or the viewers or the users. And that became uh, the transformation of magazine publishing on the internet. Uh, user content, 
of course, we're all familiar with the user content now. We don't even call that anymore. We call it fake news mostly. Okay, so now all this time, Metcalf's law is out there and it's saying connectivity is good and it attempted to quantify the network effect and it said that the, the value of a network grows as the square of the number of attached nodes or number of users or uh, let's call them nodes in the network. And over time, Metcalf's law has been attacked repeatedly. Uh, and uh, since it has my name on it, I feel obligated to defend it repeatedly. And I have for some 20, 20 or 30 years. So the value of a network grows as the square of the number of nodes. And right away, the problem occurs. What do you mean value? What, what, what's the value of a network? And how do you, so that, that was a hand wave, uh, the value somehow. Uh, so then in, in 2013, in the IEEE Computer Magazine, I wrote a paper on this topic to take another look at Metcalf's Law. Uh, for example, one of the complaints was the value could go to infinity. You know, if the number of nodes goes to infinity and you square it, suddenly you have a value going to infinity. And everybody had a hunch that the values of networks doesn't go to infinity. So there must be something wrong with my law. So I went to re-examine uh, re my law with the proviso that I would in no way change it. That is, I'm gonna look at it, but I am not backing down. I'm gonna keep the law the same, but what I'm gonna do is something orthogonal. I'm gonna take it into the, uh, uh, into the time domain. That is the number of nodes on a network. The way you keep the value from going to infinity is to keep the number of nodes from going to, to infinity. And of course, the reason they can't go to infinity is there's just so many participants. The universe of possible uh, participants is finite. So in that paper, uh, I, I devised, a, I stole a function, call, uh, I called it the netoid. Basically, it's an adoption curve function and uh, uh, chose a particular version of it and then proceeded to fit it to the growth of Facebook. I took the first 10 years of Facebook I took their monthly average users and plotted it. And I took the, uh, as a surrogate for value, I took revenue. And so then I multiplied the number of users and I squared it and I plotted them and I fit the curve and I could fit uh, uh, N squared and this adoption netoid uh, uh, curve to the growth of Facebook. Now, I have to admit, if you have a function like the netoid, you can fit just about anything with that function. But it, it also fit <laughs> the growth of the revenue of Facebook over the first 10 years. It's time, by the way, for me to go back and look and see whether there, there's any predictive power uh, in this function. So, so far in uh, the evolution of Metcalf's Law, we've looked at the number of connections. The value goes up as the square of the number of connections. We've looked at the number of nodes. The nodes grow according to this adoption curve netoid function. But next, I haven't done this yet, but next it's time to begin to look to, at traffic. So if, you, if uh, origin trail can connect two pieces of data, that's interesting. But what's the frequency of access? What's the value of that connection and how often will it be used? Uh, I haven't done any math on that. So it's time to, it's time to update Metcalf's function to to take a look at uh, the traffic. Uh, so what you all are doing is distributed. That is the blockchain at, as a, at its core is a distributed mechanism. And the, and the history of distributed mechanisms is quite bright. For example, the, e the original ethernet, we decided as a matter of principle that at each of the stations on an ethernet would have an algorithm for deciding when to send its packets on the network. And that algorithm was completely distributed, which is to say every machine on the network had the same algorithm. And that algorithm was randomized retransmissions, uh, a, a technique we stole from the Aloha network. So each of these stations had a distributed algorithm in it and that algorithm worked. That is these stations by following this randomized retransmission algorithm managed to get their packets through at very high efficiencies. So you're doing the same thing. You're taking previously centralized functions and distributing them, distributing the, uh, uh, as you track the, 
uh, various trails. Now, incidentally, in building Ethernet and the lower, the lower portions of the Internet, we left some stuff out. And you're not going to make that mistake. What we left out was security. So in the building of Ethernet, I took very seriously the archi this architectural principle of the Internet, which was the seven-layer model. There are seven layers of functionality. And I uh, took as a fact that Ethernet would be levels one and two at the bottom here. And so security was not my job. Security was the job of people at higher levels of protocol. Well, guess what? They, they didn't do their job. So today we have these major security problems. Now, I had an early hint. I was building these packets that carried all the traffic. And they had two addresses in them. They had a destination address and they had a source address. And what I noticed is that no one was paying any attention to the source address. These packets were zipping around and you could put any source address you wanted in those packets and pretend to be someplace else. So I, I took that as an early hint that those guys up there were not doing their job. I, I had a hint that if they were doing their job, they'd be looking at these, these source uh, addresses in the packets that we carefully put there. Now also recently, Metcalf's Law has been cropping up in the world of crypto. And this is terrifying to me because I don't understand crypto. But every once in a while, I read that Bitcoin is worth $40,000 because Metcalf's law says so. And this is scary. It's, uh, a, because I don't understand what they mean. But two is, when Bitcoin goes down, guess who they blame? So, I'm, uh, so there's, you have crypto, and they're even talking about this event called the flippening. Uh, have you heard of the flippening? I just heard yeah, about it. It's a famous term. It's uh, supposed to mean that uh, Bitcoin actually loses its, let's say, pole position in uh, in the market. And, and Ethereum else. takes over. Yes, basically. So Metcalf's law is supposed to have some influence on this flipping event. Well, and the theory says that... Uh, What's yeah, that? That's, uh, sorry to interrupt you, Professor. The theory is that there's more users on the <laughs> Ethereum platform or, or the blockchain because it's let's say easier to use. You can write these smart contracts, which are uh, decentralized uh, programs really on it, while you cannot do that on, on Bitcoin or at least not as easily. So that therefore the, the higher, the bigger the network, the group of, of people and developers building on it, uh, the stronger the math gets law, right? And uh, so the winner of that battle will be the one who most effectively exploits connectivity. That's what history would indicate. And uh, so Metcalf's law is playing some role in this flippening, and I can't wait, wait to see which way it goes. Um, and now let me, let me close. Uh, so I'm arguing, although I, I haven't done it very well today, but I'm arguing that connectivity is a thing. Connectivity is a powerful, dangerous, challenging thing. Uh, and connectivity has, uh, as a thing, has dimensions. You know, there's the speed, there's the latency, there's the security, there's the cost, there's the, there's all sorts of dimensions of connectivity, and you can make progress along any one of them. There's also disruptions, like uh, the uh, publishing industry got disrupted by the uh, connectivity of the internet. Um, so there's a list of these disruptions, and then there are the pathologies. the The first pathology of the internet was pornography. We all forget that, and then came advertising was a pathology. The people who built the internet were offended that it was being used to carry advertising. Boy, were we ever wrong about that. And then it became spam. That became a pathology. And now we, through the passage of time, now it's flat, it's uh, fake news is the pathology of the hour. Basically the connectivity the internet has developed over the last 50 years has come so suddenly that we don't quite know how to handle all this connectivity and it has its pathologies. And like I said, uh, fake news is one of them. Now the question is, we are now transitioning from the megabit to the gigabit ethernet with 5G and other factors. And we're moving from the cloud to the edge and all that's happening. And so what I call the gigabit internet is arriving. One could argue, and, and some do, that we're done now. The internet's done. 
we're going to hit a gigabit. And who could use more than a gigabit? I mean, that's crazy. So uh, the internet is done. And I'd like to argue that the internet is not done. It's not even begun to be done. Uh, another way of putting it is we don't yet know much about connectivity. We're just we're just beginning to learn about connectivity. And my favorite proof of this position is the, uh, the uh, neuron transistor paradox, I call it. You know, our brains are all made of these neurons. What is it, 10 to the 11th of them interconnected with these uh, little wires. And the uh, neuron is, uh, compared to a transistor, a neuron is a huge thing. I mean, you can even see it. Whereas, you know, transistors are down at five nanometers. Uh, neurons are still things you can see. They're big, big things. And they're slow. They go at, you know, in milliseconds on a good day, whereas transistors are going, you know, gigahertz at the speed of light. So you have these pitiful neurons that have been hanging around for five billion years. And you have these transistors uh, invented in 1947. And here's the paradox. Neurons make human brains, which are really, really smart. And transistors don't. So despite all their advantages in size and power consumption and, and uh, uh, speed, neurons still outcompute transistors. And why is that? And the answer is connectivity. And so there's a lot of progress ahead. We're all going to be making it in, in learning about connectivity and beginning uh, to, there's plenty of headroom. That is, there's, uh, we, we have an existence proof for something that's better connected than anything we can build. It's called the neuron. And so uh, there's plenty of headroom for connectivity. Connectivity is a thing. And uh, uh, Origin Trail is, is wise to pay attention to connectivity and enhance connectivity because it's, a very powerful and fruitful direction to go. Do you, do you have any comments based on those, uh, any questions based on those collected comments? What did well, I leave thank out? Thank you very much, this, this was really, really insightful. And uh, yeah, absolutely. I, uh, I would agree 100% that connectivity is this sort of a, a little bit of a harder um, property to pinpoint in terms of um, um, well, you have to sort of describe it with some some things like the Metcalf's law, for example, which uh, so describes it so well. Uh, but it's it's this uh, universal principle that really permeates uh, the universe in a way. And when we apply it to either the human brain and we get intelligence, or uh, computer networks, or just people networks, and as we'll see soon, uh, really knowledge networks and knowledge graphs, which uh, we'll be speaking a little, a little bit more about. The, it, the connectivity is what creates the enormous value. Um, well, do you ever the, do you ever actually discuss the connectivity aspects of a knowledge graph? Yes, absolutely. There's quite a lot of algorithms that are uh, actually uh, built to harness the connectivity of the graph. So um, the most famous one, perhaps for everybody on the call, is um, the Google PageRank. So if you have a uh, essentially a, a link, uh, a set of links on, on the web, uh, then um, it's it's not only just used for websites, it can be used on large webs as well uh, in, in several different ways. But essentially what it does, it sort of creates a notion of value based on how many links point to something, but not just in the terms of numbers, but also in terms of power. So uh, when uh, a major websites like uh, I don't know, um, CNN or some, some of these big websites point to, to some, some website. Um, since they have, let's say, more power, there's a lot of more sites linking to them. They actually transfer part of their power or value to, to another website. So this, this is just one of those. But this mm -hmm. beautifully makes a point that connectivity occurs in layers. And you're describing the connectivity of the knowledge graph Above that is are the let's say the buyers and sellers who use Google to find things, and so that's that's a graph, and it has value associated with it. Let's say the value of the transactions and how much the the buyers and sellers make and save by using by finding each other using the these page rank this this connectivity at page rank level is yielding value at buyer and seller level. So the so I guess we'll say that the layers of the internet also give us a hint that there are layers of connectivity.
that that uh, resonates so much with me, Professor, because uh, when you look at it, uh, and for example, on our our example of Origin Trail, Origin Trail itself is a decentralized network. So we have the concept of connectivity on the network level, on the let's say physical level, uh, and then uh, the net the concept of connectivity on the data level, and then finally on the application level, as you mentioned, because there's and somebody consuming all and publishing all of this information and then discovering it uh, and utilizing it on network. So uh, it, it absolutely resonates on, on multiple different levels. Okay, well, I hope these uh, collected comments were uh, prove useful uh, over time. And I'd like to reiterate the importance of what you're doing. You are, you know, this, the early Metcalf's law talked about the connection of machines and how valuable these PCs would be if they were connected. And then Facebook made it all about people, connecting people together. What you're working on is the connectivity of data and the value that can be derived from that. Definitely, absolutely. Thank you very much once again, Professor, for not only joining this call, but also joining us on this mission for building a permissionless, open, uh, decentralized system that harnesses the power of connectivity of data uh, which uh, was was the actual thing I see people asking about it that uh, that actually got us connected and uh, that you uh, made you decide to join us on this journey. So uh, I look forward to the next meeting of your advisory board. As do we as well. Uh, thank you very much, Professor. Uh, we will be uh, since we're already a bit late and over. We'll be continuing with the, with the event. I know that you will not be able to stay us for with us for the whole event, but feel free to stay as long as you can, um, as long as interesting. <laughs> um, anyhow, um, thank you once again. It was a pleasure. I will uh, continue actually with the, the presentation uh, on Origin Trail right now, which flows, I believe, very nicely into, into what you have just uh, uh, told us uh, on the history of the law. And by the way, I know you mentioned quite often that uh, that paper on the 40 years of Metcalf's law that uh, you, you kind of mentioned is behind the paywall that uh, hasn't been seen by a lot of people. Um, we, we, I obviously read it. I encourage everybody to look it up. It's um, on uh, the IEEE website and it beautifully illustrates what Professor Metcalf has, uh, has told us today, the, including the Netoid function and uh, really presenting a lot of what has been said in a graphical form. Um, and I will be sharing my screen now. Can somebody confirm that you can see my screen? I can see yeah. it. I can see it. Perfect. Thank you very much. All right, everybody. So um, I will try not to be too long uh, measuring my time. So uh, just for those of you who don't know me, I'm Branimir. I'm uh, one of the founders of Origin Trail uh, and Trace Labs, the core development company, and also the CTO. Uh, today, I'll be speaking about the decentralized knowledge graph and actually the value of semantic data. We'll be speaking quite a bit about uh, what we just heard from uh, Professor Bob Beckoff. So without further ado, we will be speaking more about how that influences the Web3 and where we are uh, heading in, in terms of the development to Web3. But before we start with Web3, let's quickly look at back at the evolution of the web uh, from, from this standpoint of of enumeration, let's say. So the original web one, let's call it like that, was really about document exchange. So when Tim Berners-Lee came up with it and, and with the HTTP protocol, uh, HTML, and all these initial building blocks, it was really about publishing all of these uh, scientific papers online. Um, it actually looked quite a lot like, um, like a scientific paper uh, document, the, the style of, of the pages. And then um, the web two, so web, web one was really about sharing these documents. Web two came about really around sharing interactions. So that's when we got um, more uh, of the data on the web actually being generated by the users. So think of your usual social network, uh, anything from MySpace up to, until today, where users generate a lot of the content. So it was no longer just the mostly read-only web, it was really a read-write web in that sense. And uh, it, it, as uh, Professor Metcalf uh, put it so well, uh, really grew with, uh, with this capability. All of a sudden, people were uh, more connected through different platforms, and the Web3 enabled so many more interactions and uh, obviously um, 
is, is very present today. The Web3, uh, however, is about meaning and it's actually about value exchange, something which is called the semantic web. And I'll try to introduce that uh, briefly by none other than the man who coined the term himself, Tim Berners-Lee, uh, who actually said a quick quote that I'll try to read uh, quickly. He said, I have a dream for the web in which computers become capable of analyzing all the data on the web, the content links and transactions between people and computers. A semantic web, which makes this possible, has yet to emerge, but when it does, the day-to-day -day mechanisms of trade, bureaucracy, and our daily lives will be handled by machines talking to machines. The intelligent agents people have touted for ages will finally materialize. And uh, essentially, he also gave us an architecture for this. And the architecture looks roughly like this. So um, not going into every single detail of it, but essentially building on top of the existing web on uh, things like URIs and URLs, on Unicode, on uh, the existing cryptography, set of data uh, specific technologies. Um, at the time, XML was the thing, but uh, today, obviously, we, we use other formats as well. RDF as, as a data interchange format, ontologies, taxonomies, querying languages, and so forth. And then finally, the top layer of proof and trust, which, are, which were envisioned as part of the original semantic web. So essentially, this kind of sandwich of technologies, this tech, was focused on um, a lot on the data and the meaning. Uh, so enabling machines to become intelligent agents, understanding what they're actually seeing. And when you give a machine raw data, the machine doesn't really have the ability to understand. So therefore, we need uh, a, a stack like this to add ontologies, to add context, to label data, to actually serialize it to have some sort of a standardized query interface where different machines can query each other and uh, understand and uh, and fetch this information that, that they're sharing. But of course, on top of all that, uh, there, uh, as Professor Metcalf really well put it, was needed a, a, a layer of security. And a layer of security, particularly in this uh, architecture presented by Tim Berners-Lee, focuses on proofs and trust. Um, and I'll briefly stay there. Well, because today, the what we consider Web3 is a little bit of different than one what Tim Berners-Lee initially thought of. Um, we consider the Web3 very much uh, um, intertwined with the notion of decentralization and blockchains. And what blockchains essentially are, are trust networks, where basically uh, we, we witnessed uh, the emergence of a new set of decentralized technologies, which is really decentralized stateful protocols to, that, we're, that are bringing trust to the Web3. And what, what does this really mean? Well, uh, the initial web of HTTP having, uh, being a stateless protocol, and for those of you who are not too technical, stateless means that it's quite simple. You can kind of exchange information between a client and a server in this traditional architecture, and that um, the protocol itself is not responsible for maintaining any information or what we call state. Uh, while today, the centralized protocols are stateful. So basically what they enable is a verifiable shared state. That means that uh, we can build novel solutions for value exchange. If you think of blockchain, it has a verifiable shared state. It's a shared ledger between a lot of different machines hosted all over the world, where you can actually verify every single entry into that ledger. And that entry is called a transaction on the blockchain. Uh, so we are able to download the whole blockchain. We're able to verify every single transaction of this shared state or shared ledger, as we usually call it in blockchains. Uh, and essentially, as these trust networks, we've been building quite a lot of interesting things on them, things like decentralized identity. So there's a very, very interesting set of technologies around this uh, and emerging startups in the space uh, with basically leverage the fact that you're not uh, in this Web3 not needing um, any sort of centralized identity broker uh, to actually give uh, the uh, opportunity um, to any application builder or any user to actually have uh, some sort of a silo proprietary centralized identity. Rather, we are actually able to provision identities ourselves. Decentralized finance, I'm sure a lot of people on this call know a lot about it, but 
in one brief sentence, it's the emergence of a lot of different solutions that we uh, are um, we know of in centralized finance worlds like lending, borrowing, all of these instruments in a in a decentralized way where there's uh, basically no no uh, single point of control or centralized entity taking care of, of all of this process, but rather intelligent agents, if you may, um, as smart contracts being uh, used to um, enable decentralized finance between uh, people and 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 other uh, agents in the world uh, today. Uh, there's also also a lot of asset tokenization. I'm sure everybody's heard of the latest uh, NFT craze, so I won't go too much into it, but essentially blockchain, uh, all of these are um, built on the substrate of blockchains being trust networks. And therefore there's a lot of value uh, and a lot of activity generated in this way uh, at the intersection of community, uh, technology, and finance in, in the blockchain space. Now, um, blockchains, like I said, they're like, uh, we see them as that uppermost layer. But uh, when we look at knowledge graphs, they are actually semantic networks. So what knowledge graphs do is they synergize data. And when you get a lot of data together, you get sort of into a situation where it's no longer just raw data, but it's actually information. It can be actionable. And the more information you get together, you get to this concept of knowledge. And essentially what, how Google explains it is this interconnected set of things rather than strings. So we're moving from this concept of raw, raw data to knowledge through connectivity. Uh, a lot of these companies today, like Google, Facebook, Amazon, NASA, Uber, many others, eBay, use knowledge graphs to extract value from their platform's data, actually from the connections between their platform's data. And um, a lot of the stuff that you're seeing on happening on Google, when you make a search or when you post something to Facebook, a lot of that actually, both of your activity ends up in a knowledge graph, but also a lot of the results you get back come from some sort of knowledge or intelligence that is been somehow deducted from your activities in that knowledge graphs. So we have blockchains as trust networks, we have knowledge graphs as semantic networks, and uh, both of them generate tremendous amounts of values for, for whoever's using them. Now, when it comes to more traditional knowledge graphs, um, this connectivity is limited. It's limited to the domain of one organization, Google or Facebook, and all of this value gets captured by that particular organization. So at Origin Trail, we're building the world's first decentralized knowledge graph, where the idea is that everybody can share this set of technologies and we can expand connectivity to wider spaces than just these platforms. So anybody can participate any device um, and therefore generate uh, the value for everyone. So what Origin Trail really does is it is organizing humanity's most important assets, making them discoverable, verifiable, and valuable. And essentially, it's a global semantic, semantic network of data and value exchange based for all network effects. So in a way, the semantic web tree comes through this synergy of knowledge graphs and blockchains as we have them today. And as it was envisioned by Tim Berners-Lee in the original architecture, so if we um, show a very simplified, uh, super simplified architecture here, sitting uh, on top of blockchains is the decentralized knowledge graph, which enables these Web3 applications. And both of these layers, the blockchains and the decentralized knowledge graph, have basically covered the architecture that Tim Berners-Lee uh, envisioned originally of the semantic web um, in this new semantic Web3 trusted sense. Um, so, Basically, the decentralized knowledge graph drives network effects. And um, we start from the notion that information is inherently valuable. We can see that in the examples I already gave. So um, all of these big companies, um, the, the largest companies really in the world, benefiting so much from the information that gets exchanged through them. Either, like I said, just going to a Google search randomly and inputting, inputting some search term that actually enriches the, the knowledge graph of Google and generates even more value. So next time when Google 
is uh, being searched maybe for the same term, they will actually uh, use the learnings from what you've done. Uh, in the, and the same concept of, of enriching a knowledge graph can be done in a decentralized manner. So taking this information, um, which is inherently valuable, we actually unlock the Metcalfe's law network effects for humanity's most important assets. And we do that in three ways. So first of all, we make all of these assets discoverable. And when I'm saying assets, I mean that in the widest context. So that means both physical assets, and I'll be speaking a bit later about how uh, origin trails already being used in the uh, tracking of physical assets uh, in the real world today, but also digital assets, assets like assets on a blockchain or just generally data assets. And making them discoverable is a very important uh, aspect of uh, enabling this uh, data connectivity to happen because without discoverability, we're not able to make these connections. So discoverability means that um, all of this knowledge that gets accumulated is able to connect to some other knowledge or is able to be used in some, um, some upper layer, uh, application layer, like uh, Professor Metcalf uh, beautifully put it, uh, uh, as connectivity also permeates through all of the layers. Um, discoverability is also important in terms of bridging data silos. So when we have situations where um, we have companies that have maintained their own data systems, like for example, even Facebook and Google and, and all of them, but also the traditional supply chain companies or generally any data system. Um, in order to bridge those, you need to have the uh, property of discoverability and um, these properties is highly important. So to, in order to, to make this bridge happen. Uh, verifiability is another one. Uh, verifiability mentioned in the context of blockchains, I briefly explained on the transactions, but this can be expanded to anything. So origin trail is a decentralized knowledge graph is actually a set of verifiable assertions. Uh, think of that as immutable data sets that have all been signed and have a cryptographic fingerprint associated with them on a particular blockchain. Why is it on a blockchain? Well, because you can always take that data set, crunch it back to its hash and compare it to the one that has been timestamped on the blockchain, see if it hasn't been changed. If it hasn't, then you, can, you have verified the integrity of this information or that it has been immutable. But also you can ver verify the signature of whoever issued this verifiable assertion or data set. And finally, you can use it on a blockchain. You can use it directly on the blockchain because you can verify that whatever data comes from the knowledge graph has a corresponding set of fingerprints on the chain that um, can verify that at certain point in time, it really had that shape. Um, so verifiable, uh, verifiability comes in various forms, but why does it matter? So uh, We can do it, but it matters in the sense that um, very much uh, in the sense which uh, Professor Metcalf mentioned. So uh, if you look at the, the problem of fake news, it's, it's really a problem of verifiability. Can you verify the source? Can you be sure that the information that has been shared is truthful? And obviously there's no algorithm in the world that you put some information in and you know, a, a true or false statement comes out and says this is the truth or not. But what we can do on a protocol level today is we can verify several things, that something hasn't been changed along the way. Some statement made by some organization is as it is, but also we can verify that indeed it comes from that organization. Then these are really powerful, uh, powerful uh, primitives. Uh, now, if you now all not only think about these assertions as separate things, but rather interconnected things, you're able to query them and you're able to formulate all kinds of answers and analytics based on verifiable data um, that is semantic and that you can base decisions on. And then finally, all of this makes data valuable. I mentioned briefly the uh, how Google does it. Um, and when you look at it, one of the biggest sort of things associated with Google search is this SEO friendliness, uh, you know, how high your website ranks or shows up on a list for a Google search, well, this basically determines the website value. So if you can, uh, if you are really easily discoverable uh, through some search term, uh, and this website um, is being clicked a lot on and has a lot of links pointing to it, uh, Google gives it much higher value and it actually sorts the list according to the value. And this value is calculated among others uh, with also this uh, Google page rank algorithm, uh, which I encourage everybody to look at. Uh, the same algorithm uh, essentially harnesses the power of network effects, not the only one, um, but also 
is really the basis of, of uh, realizing what is the most, uh, let's say, uh, the, the, the most uh, relevant or most valuable uh, asset in connection with a certain term or question or, or really just uh, um, uh, um, a requirement that somebody has from, from such a system. So again, origin trail, the decentralized knowledge graph is designed to make data discoverable, verifiable, and valuable. And it conforms to the uh, Metcalf's law, which is basically that the value is proportional to the square of the number of entities in this interconnected network. Now I'd like to finish that with a, with a quick quote by Robert Noyce, one of the co-founders of Intel, that knowledge is power, and then when you share knowledge, not, not knowledge shared is power multiplied. All right, I'm almost out of time. So just gonna quickly go through what you can do with Origin Trail. You can do several things. You can build with semantic high quality verifiable data. You can build applications on top. Uh, you can publish verifiable assertions, as I mentioned, from any system, integrate all of this data across the Web3 pretty seamlessly and easily build privacy first metaverse ready apps. So I haven't mentioned that before, but Origin Trail is completely open source and it's designed to enable anybody to own their own data. So uh, anybody can run an origin trail node in the network, anybody can connect and publish to it. Uh, and uh, with this uh, property of uh, containing some permissioned information in their own subgraph, are able to actually keep certain data private. Um, publishing public information is um, of course, therefore discover discoverability and verifiability, as I mentioned it in previous sessions. What you can also do is you can discover and crowdsource high quality data sets. This is something very interesting for the field of, of data science, machine learning, uh, AI, because uh, for all of these great algorithms, we really need lots of and uh, very high quality data. And then finally, you can tokenize your dynamic assets. So be that physical or digital, uh, Origin Trail is already actually working on, uh, on that. And um, there's quite a few uh, global leaders using it. The British Standards Institution has several applications built on top of Origin Trail. The Swiss railway company is uh, working on uh, also several implementations uh, for the last couple of years in production that are tracking supply chain uh, parts and um, with multiple partners in the European uh, rail space. Um, another interesting example is the trusted factor example with SCAN, which is actually an association of companies such as Walmart, Home Depot, Costco, and many others that you can see here. There's also other use cases in fashion, food traceability, and others that Origin Trail has already been used for. And basically, um, several interesting uh, these organizations like Walmart have awarded us. Uh, Oracle, as one of our partners, has also uh, also been traditionally in the data space as one of the original databases. Very uh, interested in the semantic web and blockchain. So uh, working together with Origin Trail. And finally, the World Economic Forum, with whom uh, we've been involved in a project uh, of actually mapping and um, um, crowdsourcing very uh, useful informational pers personal protective equipment, uh, which is uh, highly critical in this uh, situation of the pandemic. So that would be it um, uh, for my talk. I'm a little over time. Um, I just want to invite everybody who is new to Origin Trail to join the community. It's an open uh, open community, open source project. You can also take the code and play with it. You can build on top of it. And uh, yeah, you can get in touch with us at, at any point if, if this was something that um, that gets your juices flowing and you're interested in the, the, the Web3 as presented today. Um, that's it for me. So I will stop sharing my screen here. Thank you everyone for the attention. And uh, just want to briefly ask the panelists if there are any, maybe any questions or we want to proceed with John's presentation. So I take it the silence is no questions. Uh, we will continue with the presentation of one of the three bodies uh, in uh, Origin Trail, which is the Trace Alliance. Trace Alliance is very briefly an, an uh, a knowledge sharing industry hub, which actually um, incorporates um, a lot of um, academia as well. So uh, it's it's a non-for-profit organization which has several working groups active. And today we will be 
hearing from uh, John uh, Keogh as the chairman of the Trace Alliance Working Group on Supply Chain Data Interoperability and the Semantic Web. Um, I'm having a little bit of trouble seeing your presentation, John. Um, I'm not sure if anybody else has that. Um, it, it was so, okay, but it's kind of, it's just shrunk, yeah. Yeah, so we see only the left side of the presentation, like kind of like the fifth of your screen vertically. Can you try sharing it again? Yeah, sure, no problem. Awesome. So John will be presenting the, the work that the working group has been um, active on over the, the last uh, several months, almost half a year now, um, and briefly introducing the, the, the group uh, to everybody. So I will um, let you, John, introduce uh, the progress yourself as well. And uh, yeah, looking forward to seeing what, what you guys have uh, comprised. After the presentation from John, we will have a short panel uh, with uh, Damien Dooley and John Professor Bra John Braslin, who are also on call with us. Uh, John has also kindly invited me to join, so I will, I will uh, be participating in the panel as well. So we will be discussing what John pre was, is presenting now and generally the content of the whole event. All right, I'm uh, stopping here. Thank you, John. It looks okay now, so you can continue. Okay, sorry about that. I do apologize to everyone, and thank you all for staying with us. Uh, that was an incredible uh, briefing by Professor Bob Metcalf uh, earlier, and also a great follow-up uh, by Brandon Muir. So today, for the first, uh, uh, I'll, I'll make it a little bit shorter than, than I expected, but about five or six minutes, I'll give you a background to the Trace Alliance Supply Chain Data Interoperability and Semantic Web Working Group. And this is our second public update. You may remember our first update was with the FTA uh, not so long ago. So with that, uh, after I go through the overview of uh, the work that we've done, then we'll go into a panel discussion with, uh, with three speakers. So uh, very quickly, this was the purpose of the group to bring together the global, global companies, technology providers, uh, government agencies, and academics to collaborate on creating a commons-based or open source framework and recommendations that will contribute to seamless communications between disparate information technology systems in the public and private sectors. So that's what we set out to, uh, to achieve. And we decided very much like what, uh, what Bob Metc Metcalf talked about earlier, he gave us the history and trajectory of ethernet and the internet and how that evolved. And what we wanted to do was to take an independent neutral approach as well and do a literature review to look at how has this thing called uh, you know, data interoperability and semantic web evolved and who's out there having these discussions and who are the key scholars that are actually having those discussions. So we did uh, uh, bibliometric analysis using RStudio and BiblioShiny with Voss Viewer for the presentation layer. So our keywords in the research was interoperability and semantic web. Now, the institutions that uh, we worked with were NUI Galway, formerly University College Galway, my hometown in Ireland. And we have Professor John Breslin uh, on as a speaker today, a panelist. And we have Simon Fraser University. And we'll also have uh, Damien Dooley from there, who's one of the key global experts in the area of ontologies. Uh, we had, of course, uh, McGill University uh, team. We had Lincoln University in the UK. Colorado State University, uh, Professor Steve Simsky, who uh, Steve is uh, pretty well known in the GS1 world. He's been uh, contributing to a lot of the GS1 standards. He has, uh, I don't know, 100 to 200 uh, patents in the area of uh, secure printing and, uh, and, and so on. So really brilliant people. We had Professor Samuel Fasawamba from Toulouse Business School with us as well. One of the top five most referenced authors in the area of uh, big data. And our key researcher uh, is studying at the Tunisian. He's studying at the university in Hungary. Unfortunately, uh, he got uh, one of his family members is ill and he couldn't join us uh, today. And we hope everything works uh, well. We also had uh, one of our key uh, researchers from the University of Portsmouth who focuses heavily on AI. And we had an intern team uh, from McGill University, the University of British Columbia, and also University of Toronto. And they are Kelly, Bridget, and Somia. If you're on, thank you so much for the fantastic work that you did. 
and uh, we'll have some follow-up with them uh, pretty soon. So when we looked at the history and trajectory of uh, uh, interoperability and semantic web, we our first search came back with uh, these papers here on the left-hand side. So 2,273 uh, conference papers. Now conference papers are indicative of you know, open conversations where the conversations are, are actually happening. Uh, and the conversations are around, sorry, my video went off there for some reason. But the conversations are around uh, sharing knowledge, sharing early discussions with, uh, with peers to get feedback. And you can see that that's quite dominant here. The published articles are typically the ones that are then uh, peer reviewed, uh, book chapters, uh, conference reviews, and so on. So this is, uh, this is what we found in the initial uh, research. And when we look at the different journals that are publishing, there's no surprise that the International Journal on Semantic Web uh, had uh, one of the top and the Semantic Web Journal itself. And you can go down and see there's quite a, a, a different uh, or a, a big group of journals that are publishing on interoperability and semantic web. So we also looked a little bit further and we looked at uh, the most productive countries. And this is also helps us to understand the focus in some of the academic institutions, but also it could be a focus from policymakers, from government that's supporting uh, research in different countries. It could be also industry that's very prominent and dominant within those countries as well. So you can see here that the United States is, uh, has the highest number of publications, uh, followed by Germany. Not surprising, Germany is in there with uh, Internet 4.0. Uh, UK, Italy, and Spain. There's quite some surprises in here as well. You know, with the Netherlands, Greece. Uh, this uh, was a surprise for me, and Canada also with 115. Um, now, if you look at the right-hand side, we looked at different collaborations between different countries, and this could be indicative again of uh, you know collaboration between academic institutions, but it could also be driven by trade agreements and trade deals that are in place, or uh, it could be, for example, a trade bloc like the EU or also APEC, Asia Pacific Economic Collaboration, which has 21 economies that collaborate uh, uh, for, um, for trade. So then we looked at the most productive uh, institutions around the world. We did some mapping here and uh, very pleased to see that the National University of Ireland Galway is actually the top producing institute and Professor John Breslin, Breslin is with us today. But also the number of three is also was part of the NUI Galway and perhaps John can explain that later when we get into the panel discussion. But the Digital Enterprise Research Institute or DERI, D-E-R-I, uh, was a collaboration between uh, NUIG and a, a, a European university. I don't know, John, if it was uh, Austria. In Austria, or, that's or, right, John. Yeah. Yeah. Austria, yeah, fantastic. Thank you, John. So you can see that we, we actually have the top producing uh, professor uh, with us today with the incredible output from NUI in Galway and uh, their Dairy Institute. So congratulations for that. And of course, they become then the key influencers uh, around the world as they get cited and others pick up on the work and the advancements that they've made. But when, when I do get to the panel discussion, I'm going to ask John about that trajectory and and how NUI and Galway got involved so early in the discussion around uh, interoperability and semantic web and so on. So we also looked at the uh, co-authorship network and you can see that uh, Professor Breslin is on this list as well uh, with, uh, with 12 publications. And, and this also tells us who's collaborating with who. So for example, the number one and two author here, uh, Domingo, uh, Domingo and uh, Girard, they don't collaborate. Uh, we also found that the third and the fourth are not collaborating. So these are individual scholars who have a particular lens or worldview uh, and technical expertise that they actually focus on and that we can also learn from that. So in our paper, we actually explore that and we try to find out why is that? Why is there no collaboration? Or in some cases, why are uh, uh, individuals, uh, experts collaborating? This may seem like uh, this, is, this chart is, uh, is important for us. Actually, it's automatically created. It's a keyword co-occurrences. So we have six different clusters of information here. We can see the SW, semantic web, and then ontology and interoperability, uh, RDF, linked data, all of these became quite important. So what we've actually done in the paper 
we've mined into each of these clusters and we're trying to figure out what, what's happening within this cluster and what is the direction of travel? Where has it come from? How has it evolved? Who's influencing discussions? Which countries are involved? Which institutions are involved? Which scholars are involved? And are they collaborating? So there's a lot of learnings that we can extract from this type of, of data. I know it's probably the first time that many of you have seen this level of data and we would gladly share with anyone afterwards the tools that we used are also open source and we can share with you actually a, uh, an instructional guideline uh, in PowerPoint on how to actually replicate what we've done here. So we wanted to keep this uh, uh, and, and make sure that this is, uh, has the scholarly integrity and, uh, and can be replicated as well. So some of our next steps on the right hand side is just an example. We're going to look at the things that we believe are important. We're currently processing the three critical reviews that we had from three professors, which uh, fantastic feedback just on tightening the document. No major changes at all, just on tightening it up a little bit. And then finalizing the sections on the implications for policymakers, practitioners and scholars. And you may remember that the FDA, the US FDA, uh, on, from our previous call, they are an observer uh, for this group. We also have uh, ag research from New Zealand, uh, and we have the city of Dubai as well. That's also uh, an observer. And it's very important for us to get that feedback from uh, policymakers. And we'll extend that out to others as well, uh, including CFIA in Canada, the Canadian Food Inspection Agency and other agencies. Uh, we're also looking at what are the implications here for practitioners? How do we get started? And we'll bridge that, that in the conversation in a few moments. Then we'll publish the working copy at this point in time due to the illness in the family of our key researcher we're slightly delayed by about two weeks so we're hoping to have the paper published at the end of september so about two weeks from now and we will publish a working draft copy to get feedback and after we get that feedback we will submit to a journal so on that, we have our panel discussion that we'll go through for about uh, 20 minutes. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, John Breslin, John is an incredible uh, guy, uh, personally and uh, professionally. He's a professor at NUIG in Galway, and he's probably one of the most uh, famous or well-known uh, academics in Ireland and, and, and abroad, but he, for all of the work that he's actually doing, also a very strong entrepreneur. Damien is incredible. I'm so happy to have been introduced to Damien earlier this summer. Damien knows where the dead bodies are buried, as I, as I call it, and I'd like to welcome both of them to open up their cameras right now. Uh, Damien is in Vancouver, Canada, and uh, he's the lead at the Center for Infectious Disease, Genomics and One Health, and also does a lot more, including he was the lead author on a fantastic paper called Food on our Food Ontologies. And of course, we have uh, Brandon Mayer as well. So with that, I'm going to do a stock share and uh, get the three panelists up on the screen. Are you all there? You are? Fantastic, yeah. wonderful. So thank, thank you all for joining us. We have about uh, 15 to 20 minutes and uh, you know, I was really taken aback by our, our nicely in, in, in that, that sense when Bob mentioned that the work that we're actually doing with uh, the Trace Alliance and, and with the, this, this work group, um, he said this work is very important. He also said the work is very hard. He also said it takes a long time and timing is important. He also said we're playing with fire. He talked about interoperability versus standards. And in fact, what we're looking at is standards-based uh, interoperability. So a lot of things for us to, uh, to look at, a lot of things for us to consider. Let me move my camera down here. So a lot of things for us to consider. What I'd like to do first is uh, open up to, to John Breslin. John, if you can give us uh, just a quick overview of the work that you have been focused on over the last uh, X amount of years and, and, and how and why did Galway take such a quick lead? Thanks, John. So it's a pleasure to be here today and um, delighted to talk about this topic. Um, yeah, we were, I suppose, uh, there was some planning, I suppose, John, like sometimes things happen by accident and some things kind of happen by, by plan. But um, in Galway, um, the university applied to a national body, which was called or is called Science Foundation Ireland, which at that time was trying to establish world-class research centers in different areas around the country. 
So they took the very successful model from the National Science Foundation in the US, the NSF, and tried to see what elements of that they could replicate in Ireland, which is a small country, but you know we, uh, we have um, a strong educational um, backgrounds, you know, very highly educated uh, people. So at that time, which was in 2003, um, the a Semantic Web Institute was established in, in, in Galway, uh, uh, funded by Science Foundation Ireland. And what they did essentially was they brought in a couple of the top Semantic Web researchers who had been involved in the early um, days, the you know, standards like RDF and so on. And they based them in Galway and they established research teams around them. And as you saw in the in the presentation earlier that, that you had, um, it became true. Uh, the institute was called the Digital Enterprise Research Institute. It's now the Data Science Institute at, at NUI Galway. It became one of the top, uh, in fact, it was the top uh, semantic web institute in, in, in the world. And um, great to see, I think, you know, it, it shows, you know, I, I was on a panel discussion about rural innovation earlier on in the week. And it shows that, you know, I think no matter where you are, if you put your mind to it, you can make great stuff happen in, in, in wherever you want to. So, you know, Galway is, is a small city. It's, um, you know, many Europeans would classify it as, as a town in terms of size. Um, but, you know, there, there's world leading research going on there and uh, still to this day. And actually one of the people on your list, I saw one, one of my colleagues who is still working with me, uh, he was higher up that ranking, whatever, um, um number of publications he had because i can't remember but um you know just still great people working at the institute today uh in in this area so my, my own specific fantastic. interest yeah sorry sorry johnny i was gonna say my own, my own specific interest has traditionally been in the area of um social semantic web which was basically using semantic web to connect social websites together but that's evolved over time and i'm now involved in uh, you know these kind of efforts along uh, supply chain blockchain and um as much semantic web stuff as I can do as well in, in the meantime. Yeah, fantastic. And of course, uh, great to see my hometown university. I grew up uh, playing on the grounds of uh, what was then University College Galway, now NUIG. So my father used to work at in the anatomy department uh, there. So fantastic to see that. Congratulations, John, on that. I'll yeah. come back to you in a few moments, John. But Damien, I want to go over to you because you know I, I've yet to meet someone that can explain ontologies like you can. Um, uh, you know. First off, give us a little bit about your uh, your background and what you've been working on over the last uh, few years. But also, can you help us understand what ontologies are versus taxonomies? Sure. Um, so I I work actually as the ontology development lead at the Center for Infectious Disease uh, Genomics and One Health, and I've uh, been doing that for about eight years. Um, we started out with a mandate to just um, try to do, create controlled vocabulary for describing uh, foodborne infectious disease, E. coli, salmonella, listeria outbreaks uh, for a public health agency here in British Columbia, and recognize that the vocabulary problem there in terms of trading information about outbreaks across health agencies in Canada and actually around the world was a big problem. So uh, we turned to ontologies to solve that. and. I've been involved in the um, in the uh, Obo Foundry uh, family of ontologies as a kind of group of uh, compatible ontologies that allow us to expand and curate this vocabulary in the biomedical domain. So the mandate, though, keeps on creeping more broadly. It's uh, <laughs> we started out with just foodborne infectious disease vocabulary, but now we need a vocabulary for food products, and now we need a vocabulary for how they're packaged. Um, and now the blockchain people are interested because they're interested in traceability and willing to uh, fund some of this development. And now the U.S. Department of Agriculture is interested because they have nutritional data they want to offer about food, and so. It's just uh, become an explosion um, that the semantic web is trying to tool up to handle uh, in terms of information and um, how to not just find it, but how to compare it. And that's kind of the key word. I, I totally agree that um, there's this initial perception that the internet has, um, has solved the uh, connect connectability problem, but actually the next level in that is the comparability problem of data. So that's where I'm at right now with uh, turning to ontologies to try to help solve 
Uh, I'll just put in a plug. Uh, you mentioned like, what is the difference between an ontology and a taxonomy? <laughs> so uh, here's, here's a great book. It's uh, Caught in the Web of Words, James Murray and the Oxford English Dictionary. So 130 years ago, um, this fellow was charged with putting together the Oxford English Dictionary first edition. And uh, he thought it would take five years in the end, he had to hire kids. Uh, so <laughs> the, uh, that illusion that, uh, sorry, the, uh, the, uh, the statement that it, some things seem fast, other things seem slow. Indeed, what we're doing now with ontologies is redoing all of this curation work in the sciences for every term. And the difference between ontology and taxonomy is that uh, whereas you might have a single hierarchy uh, to describe a particular domain of vocabulary like taxonomy or anatomy, um, the ontology part is to actually bring in other relations to attach terms in a more complex fashion between areas uh, of semantic meaning. So yeah, in a nutshell, okay. I could I, I, go on too long about that. I'm going to, <laughs> no, wonderful, wonderful. I, I'm, so I'm going to ask you a question on ontology and then I'm going to lead into to Brandemir. If you, you can answer first, then I'll go to Brandemir and, and, and John. So, you know, Origin Trail is all about uh, open source. It's independent, it's neutral, as Brandemir talked about uh, earlier. But are ontologies also uh, independent and neutral and open source? And and can we trust them? Right. Uh, over so, to you first, Damien. Right. So um, some ontology uh, ontologies are opened out to the world and offered by corporations or by um, nonprofit or even more informal groups of curators. The uh, but essentially, this is a language problem we're facing. Ontologies are being used to describe data structures, to describe data, and to say what's comparable and what isn't. But the more you have a siloed ontology that talks about a siloed uh, database, just fulfilling sort of the purpose of creating a data structure, whether it be an RDF or graph or whatever database technology you want, the more that ontology is not being curated by curators who are talking with other disciplines, other domains, the people who are being um, consumers or providers of that siloed data, the more you actually end up with an ontology that's just as much a silo as the data itself that it's sitting on uh, trying to describe. So there is a critical um, leap here in language development, sort of like Pigeon English or Lingua Franca to describe these data structures. And that leap is to make sure that you are curating with uh, people across domains who are uh, exchanging this information. Yeah, very important. Thank you so much, uh, Damien. Brandemir, uh, same question to you around open source ontologies. Can we trust them? Just building on what Damien uh, mentioned. Yeah, it's... Um... I totally agree with, with Damien's point, and it, it again reinforces this um, uh, importance of openness, where you can sort of build anything in a silo, and, and quite often it's easier. Like, trust me, building a decentralized system is way harder <laughs> than uh, any sort of centralized system. And then if you go into the, the, the data part, especially, but uh, it, it then, it, then it, you get into this data silo situation quite, quite easily. And, uh, we've seen um, efforts of joint development of ontologies, as for, like for example, schemas like um, uh, the schema of org is, is something that's been, you know, uh, collaboratively developed uh, within uh, the domain of let's say search engines. But we've also seen a lot of interesting stuff happening with GS1, uh, where it's it was all about supply chains and how we explain uh, events in supply chains. Like right now, the the, the new standard introduces new events. And what's great about it is that uh, it's being developed in a collaborative manner. Um, can we trust them? Well, that's that's uh, that's another very good point. I think uh, a good principle of this space is uh, trust but verify. And in that sense, would be to verify not only in terms of uh, usefulness but also in terms of integrity. And is it really uh, the the right thing to do? Uh, is it really the right thing to use? Um, but it, they're definitely necessary. So without having the notion of ontologies or taxonomies, whatever choice tool is needed for, for, for a certain application, 
it's really about knowledge representation. And without that, you kind of end up with, again, with raw data um, or semi-structured data. So without with wanting to somehow use it intelligently, uh, this is absolutely necessary and 100% um, and needed to be done in some sort of collaborative manner, unless you're really building something very, for, very much for yourself and, and uh, you don't want to interact with the world. Gotcha. I, I'll get, I'm going to ask the, this question to all three of you, starting with John Breslin, but as, as ontologies are, are developed, can that actually pose a risk to IP? Uh, you know, can you actually be forced to expose your IP through an ontology development? How does that work? John, do you have any practical experience on the managing IP? And I know Brandemir will have a particular view on that as well. So over, over to you, John. Um, I guess it, it depends where you, you know somebody thinks the IP lies. You know, IP is kind of a difficult one to. Um, you know, I, I'm not a, a a lawyer, but I you know I, I don't see how a lot of IP would would lie in something coming from from an ontology. Maybe the data uh, that that you might um, try try and align to it. And Damien might have some opinions on this as well. But you know, ontologies normally, and again, I haven't seen. A lot of licenses applied to ontology. Sometimes, to the specification of ontology, you might say this is available under a Creative Commons license, and you can kind of do which, what you want with it. But typically, the ontologies themselves are, um, you know, because they're based on on an open uh, standard. Like, for example, let's say it's the, the World Wide Web Consortium's RDF um, technology. That's an open standard that can be used by anybody. And then you're defining an, an ontology based on, uh, on on this technology. There wouldn't necessarily be. I don't think IP in that ontology itself. Um, however, I suppose, you know, back to, back to your question about can you trust it? I suppose it depends what you mean by trust. Like, do you trust the terms that people have um, defined in the ontology to be correct or, you know, meaningful? Or do you have trust in that when that ontology evolves in the future that you will still be able to use it? I think there are kind of interesting questions, but what, what I would say is, um, a bit like if you adopted any open, open source uh, software or, or techno technology, it depends who developed it and it depends how much you trust those people. So, you know, when, when we worked on ontologies in the past, we basically tried to bring together a consortium of people uh, from reputable institutions, from universities, from uh, industry, from startups. And when you see the range of people involved in some ontology developments, then you start to trust it. And similarly, um, you know, from the ontologies I've seen so far, they tend to be open, they tend to be reusable. But somebody in, in, in a corporate can say, you know what, I want to reuse parts of that ontology um, internally, and I want to use it for my own proprietary data, and whether there's IP associated with that or not, I, 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 I don't know. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't need to make that available to the outside world. I can still keep that internally. So again, that's a principle of open source is that you can choose to reuse it uh, in, in your own system, according to the license, depending on the license, um, without necessarily having to suddenly expose you know, the 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 system itself or, or the data. So a similar concept with ontologies, you can, you know, I think you can you can rely on it to the extent that you know the people who are involved in it. And that there is, I suppose the important thing I would be looking for if I was trying to trust an ontology would be some kind of, you know, future life cycle to make sure it's going to be maintained and updated because um, you want, you, you know, you want it to be current. And uh, one of the ontologies that I worked on, you know, about 15 years ago, um, even though it's been about three years since I've updated, I still try to maintain that principle that, you know, as things happen and as updates happen, we'll try and, and, and make changes to it. And I'm looking at a kind of an updated version from 2018 here on my screen. And, uh, you know, I, I think people can trust that because it's had longevity. Wonderful. Thank you so much, John. Brandemir, over to you around the uh, protecting uh, IP. Um, you, you talked about this briefly earlier as well. How does how does the OT platform, and a, as it evolves into knowledge graphs, how does it does it protect IP? Particularly regarding what Origin Trail knowledge graph focuses on is uh, the ability to provably show ownership of a certain uh, asset, data asset, data set, uh, and the ability to actually exchange it with anybody within the network. You know. The structure, the ontologies, you know, basically are uh, part of that set of application technologies that are there to, you know, enable you to use something or not use something. But essentially, when it comes to the um, it, it itself, the protocol um, being completely open source, there's 
uh, no sort of um, um, reason. And actually, the, the principle is not to um, have it in any way protected because it has to be completely public infrastructure and it has to be uh, as usable as possible to everybody. So in that sense, um, that of course applications built on top of origin trail are a different story that everybody can build anything they want so they can pr approach ip um, questions um, from their own angle and and then they do so enterprises might not be building for example applications that are as um, something that we see in DeFi, which is completely public sometimes you don't even know who made it um, while on the other hand uh, enterprises have their own requirements quite often keeping uh, some data, very, very sensitive data uh, in, 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 let's say, a private setting, but still discoverable so that you're able to find it and then somehow exchange it with the right uh, party. And then obviously the IP of that solution uh, is some something which is involving the, the organization, in particular implementation, similar to something that you can build on, let's say, in, in Ethereum. It's also an open platform, but um, um, the solution on top of it is, is a different story. It can be a different story. Um, but when it comes to that, generally as the open ecosystem, we believe that the principle if, uh, of having it completely neutral and open and based on open standards um, minimizes any of the potential trouble. So using things like GS1 standards, RDF, we also, also mentioned anything really that coming out of W3C that is, uh, let's call it really a common good is something that, that is interesting uh, and, and uh, not just interesting, but sort of a, a core principle of origin trail. It's, um, it, we, we will not be seeing any proprietary data structures included uh, because it's, it's, um, it immediately uh, defeats the purpose. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you, Brandemir. Now, I have a final question. We have about uh, just one to two minutes left just for Damien and John. Uh, I, I want to ask about organizations. Where where should organizations start? And you can include your your final comments as well, uh, Damien. If I go over to you, uh, we we know that this is difficult work. It takes a long time. Um, but where could an organization realistically start? Right. So um, I know there's. I'll give an example. There's a British company called Sidebyte uh, that's been bought by Elsevier, and they are. Their uh, goal is to help corporations. I'm not. This is not a plug for them, but <laughs> their goal is to help corporations work with ontologies. And what they've done is they've created a system where they can mint their own, create their own ontology terms, but then replace them out as the ontology community catches up and uh, is able to offer open source ontology uh, terms. So there's this notion that um, organizations do not have to buy into the whole semantic web, bleeding edge technology, uh, but they can either start to use, and use these vocabularies internally to describe their data structures and thereby eventually get trained up in how to data share. Or the other option is to um, just work with their external partners who are also syncing up on ontology uh, driven data description and view the whole semantic web layer as an external layer to convert their uh, their data from. I think both of those ways are kind of safe moves. The internal use can just be um, about categorical variables, just naming things and coming up with the pick lists uh, and making their own ontology, but then making sure they've got a whole system built in for deprecation and replacement in their databases uh, as, as they start to trust these external ontology resources. Wonderful, excellent guidance, Damien. Thank you. Uh, same question for for John Breslin. Yeah, I think for creating ontologies, um, John, I, I I agree. Actually, something I picked up from from Damien there was either you know working on your own or working with with, with other organizations who are trying to do the same thing. And um, you know, in the end, I suppose when you're creating an ontology around some particular domain, you're looking for an expert in that domain who can who can clearly define terms. I was working on an ontology for social web and I had built some social websites so I kind of understood how they worked um, and I was able to bring it kind of so far um, but I still had to talk to other people to make sure that you know my bias or my interpretation of what these terms were were the same as other people's interpretations and that leads obviously to interesting discussions around you know how you name things and how you connect things as Damien mentions you know the different relationships you have between data and um, so you can already do that you know internally in your organization with a, you know, a group of experts who are familiar with the domain or you and other organizations who are experts in, in the domain can, can do this. 
I think um, I, I was making an analogy in my head between you know developing an ontology and developing a startup. When you're developing a startup, you're trying to decide what kind of features you're going to do, what kind of you know stuff you're going to add to your product. And, and same thing with with um, with an ontology. You want to make sure you choose the right terms and you've got agreement on those terms. You don't want to be kind of adding things based on anecdotes or maybe one signal from one person. Like you, when you're doing a startup, you don't want to add a feature based on one story or one person. You want repeatability and you want kind of people confirming these are right, the right things to have in there. So I think a community of users to help you build that ontology and experts from the domain would be a good start. Wonderful. John and Damien, thank you so much for sharing your expertise. Damien, uh, the guru of ontologies plus plus, uh, you know, we, we had uh, earlier, we had Bob, the father of uh, Ethernet, John Breslin. Uh, I'm going to label you the father of Semantic Web right now, based on the work yeah, I'm, that I'm, I'm the grandson, I think, of Semantic Web. <laughs> <It's been laughs> but we're, we're so happy to have the collaboration. And as, as, as pointed out earlier, the work is not done yet. We still have uh, a lot of work to do. It's difficult work. It's hard work. And for those of you listening in, uh, there will be some announcements uh, soon, of course, with the draft of the paper, but the draft of the paper will be fed into the working group, which will have policymakers, practitioners, and uh, the scholars will take a break for a while after that. But this work continues, and it is very hard work. So with that, I'd like to pass over to Brandemir for the closing comments. Yes, thank you, John, and thank you, everyone. Uh, John Breslin, Damien Dooley, uh, uh, Bob, Professor Bob Mecha for, for participating today. This was, uh, in my opinion, I enjoyed the event quite a lot. This was a great event. Uh, we had quite a lot of attendees also. Thank you to everybody attending. Uh, it was great discussing all these topics uh, around uh, the semantic web ontologies, uh, connectivity really as, as well put, and seeing your progress on uh, within the Trace Alliance Working Group. And I'm excited to see in two weeks uh, how uh, everybody reacts on, on the published paper. Um, I'd like to uh, thank you everybody and just uh, in, uh, mention that we will be having uh, more such events in the future. Like John mentioned, we had FDA recently. Uh, one of the, the points of Trace Alliance and Origin Trail is not just to promote connectivity on the data network level, but also on the people level. And, um, and that's why Origin Trail has a very vibrant and, and interesting community, both in terms of academics and, and uh, businesses but as well as uh, the general origin trail community. So I invite everybody to join us, uh, read more about it, uh, join, uh, come to our uh, community outlets on Discord, Telegram, Twitter, uh, get into conversation. We don't have to end this chat here. So we're available online. Um, uh, I know John is also available online. He's quite active on Twitter. Um, so let's continue and let's stay connected. Thank you everybody and uh, see, you, see you next time. Bye. Cheers.